When using molecular orbital theory to solve for the electronic structure of uh, polyatomic molecules, uh, the task actually gets much more complicated as we look at more and more complex molecules. And those are the ones that usually we're more interested in in the end. So what I want to do is talk about the general process of doing that and ways in which we can uh, maybe uh, find simpler approximations that would serve the purpose to get the information that we want. All right, so I'll remind you that in MO theory, basically the whole idea is we're going to use linear combinations of atomic orbitals, abbreviation LCAO, to form our molecular orbitals. Now what this means uh, functionally is that if I have a molecular orbital, I'll call it molecular orbital K, and so this is the wave function that describes the electrons in that particular molecular orbital. We can generally write this as a linear combination of the atomic orbitals, and I'll just use small phi for the atomic orbitals. So CK1, CK2, and so forth for all of these uh, atomic orbitals. You know, so we're going to sum over some large number of those, and uh, I guess I should probably make sure that we understand these are atomic orbitals. They could be hybrid orbitals, but they're atomic orbitals that are associated with uh, different atoms. And um, this uh, can be an arbitrarily large uh, selection of, of orbitals. So when we find these coefficients, uh, we're, we may have a very long expression that would uh, express that. So we're not necessarily doing this by hand. We're mostly doing this on the computer. Now, uh, as we've seen in earlier things, the number of, of molecular orbitals that we get out of this process is going to be equal to the number of atomic orbitals that are put in. So in other words, however many of these we add together uh, to get molecular orbitals, we will get that number of molecular orbitals out. Um, and they, generally speaking, will be limited. Uh, this is the linear variational method, so they'll be upper bounds to the energies that they represent, but not exactly equal to them. Now, in solving uh, for this, what we're really solving for is a secular determinant that looks like this. All right, so this H is a Hamiltonian uh, that is made up of combinations of these atomic orbitals. So let's say I've got this sort of expectation value. That would represent H, M, N, M, N, an element in this matrix. I would also need to calculate the overlap integrals between these different atomic orbitals. And so this would be equal to S, M, N one of the elements of this particular matrix. So these are both square matrices that span this set of atomic orbitals. And when I solve this equation, I am solving for the energy levels of all of the molecular orbitals that are involved and the coefficients, and I'll write those as C, K, J, uh, so I'm solving for these to describe those orbitals. I, I, I keep repeating this because I want to be sure that this is something that you're getting out of this approach to uh, dealing with molecular problems. Okay, so let's take a look at what this secular determinant looks like for a big system. So I'm going to draw a big old thing here. And um, up in this upper left-hand corner, I'll have H11 minus ES11. Now, H11 and S11 are defined here. They are numbers. The E is the thing we're solving for. Okay, next one down would be H21 minus ES21, and so forth. And I keep going down. And so down here, if the number of atomic orbitals that I'm including in this calculation is sum, it is N, then I would have HN1 minus ESN1. Okay, so that I've got a bunch of things here. In the next column over, here I would have H12. And it turns out that H12, or I should say HMN, is equal to HNM. Because H is a Hermitian operator, and this is one of the general properties that we would have for the Hermitian operators. All right, so minus ES12. And down here, I'd have H22 minus ES22. I'm not going to write all these elements out, but you get the idea. All right, now this would continue down along the diagonal until I get down here 
to HNN minus ESNN would be the lowest right hand corner. All right. So I have this big square determinant that I need to evaluate. And I'm going to set this big square determinant equal to zero and solve for the values of E that make that happen. All right, this looks like a massive job, and it is. Thank, thank goodness we have computers that can do this. But I want to share with you some different strategies that we can use to make this a little bit simpler. All right, so first of all, and this is one that we'll get to in the last module, but I want to mention it now. And that is if there is symmetry in this polyatomic molecule, we can use that symmetry to organize the molecular orbitals. In other words, each of the molecular orbitals could have um, they could have symmetry properties, and if we put the molecular orbitals that have the same symmetry properties together, it turns this big secular determinant into a smaller one. So now I might have different blocks along here forming my secular determinant. So I might have a block up here, I might have a block here, and a block here of molecular orbitals that are related by symmetry. And because they are related by the same symmetry but not related to the other sets of molecular orbitals, all the elements out here are zero. All right, well that simplifies things greatly because now all I have to do is solve this secular determinant equal to zero, this secular determinant equal to zero, and this secular determinant equal to zero separately. So that makes the problem much, much more tractable when we can do that. All right, and we'll say, uh, you know, something a little bit more, um, you know, when we get to talking about symmetry. I'll mention that each block is a separate eigenvalue problem, okay? So that's what makes them separable. The solutions, though, are still exact as they would be even if we had this big full matrix and still had that symmetry. All right, but um, this basically greatly simplifies the problem and makes it possible to do. Now, another thing we can do to simplify these problems is we've noticed, uh, say in the case of building the Walsh diagrams, that uh, we could ignore the 1s core orbitals on a second row poly on a second row element. And in fact, the core electrons tend not to participate so much in bonding. So in other words, we could basically limit our treatment to valence orbitals and not worry about mixing in the core orbitals at all. And this is actually not, not a terrible, not a bad approximation. This would reduce the size of the, the overall size of this secular determinant here because now there are certain terms here that I wouldn't need to include because they include only core orbitals on those atoms. All right, so this one, uh, this one I, I would say is, is a fairly common assumption. Um, it is approximate because there is some mixture of those core orbitals in the, uh, in the others, uh, but it is not a terrible approximation. Okay, a third thing that we can do to simplify this problem is we can neglect the overlap between different atomic orbitals. Now what kind of approximation is that? Okay, uh, for one thing, uh, I should mention that this has the acronym NDO, ne ne Neglect of Differential Overlap. When you think about it, if two atomic orbitals are on the same atom, they are orthogonal already, so this isn't an approximation at all. But if two orbitals are on different atoms, now I've got two atoms that are far apart. They may be bonded to one another. And we've already seen that there is a little bit of overlap between them. Okay, but if they're far enough apart, and especially if they're two atoms that are pretty far apart in a molecule, their atomic orbitals don't overlap much at all. So this is an approximation, especially for atoms that are directly bonded to one another, but for other atoms, it's probably not a bad approximation at all. Okay, so um, this is one that uh, we'll see is common to a large number of different um, approximations that one can make to solve this problem, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit in just a moment. All right, now another thing we can do is to adopt a simplified Hamiltonian. Now, I, I don't want to be more specific than that in this point, but let me give you an example, um, and one that we'll talk about for the rest of this lesson. 
Let's suppose that uh, we want to look at a pi bonding system. And we want to basically approximate that the pi bonds are separate from the sigma bonds. Well, we might uh, develop one set of molecular orbitals to address the sigma bonds and simply use p orbitals to address the pi bonds. All right, so this is one way that we could treat them separately. It is approximate because we do have mixing between the s and the p orbitals in these cases, uh, but this one is also not, uh, depends on the system, but it can be a very effective way of approximating it. Now, having said this, let me mention that these two and this together are uh, generally found when we talk about semi-empirical methods. All right, so let me unpack this word semi-empirical. An empirical method is one that, that uh, is basically totally based on observed quantities. In other words, you're going to take some observed quantities from an experiment, and you're going to connect them in some simple mathematical way to calculate something else. That's an empirical method. Semi-empirical is one where we're going to take some observed quantities and combine them with other quantities that come from calculating the quantum mechanics on first principles. All right, so in this particular sense, um, these semi-empirical methods are ones where we're going to do some quantum mechanics, but it's quantum mechanics that's been scaled back because we are incorporating a lot of information that we may already know, for example, about the values of these matrix elements. We may use observed calculations or, or experiments to fill in values for these different types of uh, numbers that go into the secular determinant. There's a number of different things that we could do, but these are the things that are common to semi-empirical methods, and we're going to spend the rest of this lesson talking about uh, one of the earliest of those semi-empirical methods, the Huckel theory.